let us pray. Lord, as we come to read your word, for which we are thankful, we ask that you would pour out the blessings of your Holy Spirit upon our heart, that we might understand your word, and understanding it, we might be doers of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, starting with verse 7. Now Herod, the ruler, heard about all that had taken place, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see him. Dropping down to verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Messiah of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. <clears throat> there was a man who pulled up to a gas station, and an attendant came out. You can tell this was some time ago, but attendants don't come out of gas stations anymore. But an attendant came out and noticed that the back seat of the man's car was full of penguins. And he asked the man, what is this? And the man said, well, there were a bunch of penguins in the middle of the road. And he said, I was afraid they were going to get hit. So I picked them up and put them in my car. He said, I was really kind of perplexed as to what to do with them. And so the gas station tenant said, well, take them to the zoo. And the guy said, well, yeah, that's the thought. The next day, the guy comes back, and his car is still full of people. And so the tenant says, didn't you take them to the zoo? And he said, yeah, we had a great time. We're going to the beach today. <laughs> Apparently, the guy was perplexed in more ways than one. <laughs> we read in the scripture today that Herod was perplexed. Herod didn't know what to think. Something or someone was stirring up the countryside, shaking up things. There were reports of powerful preaching and large crowds and amazing miracles, and nobody really seemed to know for certain what was going on. And so some people were saying, and Herod of course heard all these rumors, that John the Baptist had risen from the dead and was out preaching again. Some said that some other ancient prophet must have arisen from the dead, or even that it was Elijah who long ago had been taken up before he died and who was supposed to return before the Messiah came. <coughs> Not long before this, John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod. John the Baptist had been preaching uh, against Herod's taking his brother's wife for his own. And so that certainly irritated and angered Herod. Yet nobody had seen anything like John the Baptist for over 400 years. There had been a spiritual drought, as it were, from the end of the Hebrew Scriptures to the beginning of the Gospels. It was 400 years of time. And no one for those 10 generations had seen anything like the power of John the Baptist. Uh, but now someone was out in the countryside again, even after John had been killed, uh, doing the same thing that John had done, with even greater power. Herod had, of course, in a moment of, of drunkenness at a party, uh, had had John the Baptist uh, beheaded at the behest of uh, his wife and uh, stepdaughter, I guess, and had even seen that he had brought to him on a platter as evidence that his orders were carried out. But now people were saying that John the Baptist was risen again. And this, of course, perplexed Herod. Because as much as he disliked what John the Baptist had been saying about him, it says in other scriptures that he was intrigued by John the Baptist, loved to hear him preach. He was kind of like a moth in darkness attracted to a flame. And so now he was perplexed as to what was going on. But the one that Herod and even the crowds in the countryside were perplexed over wasn't John the Baptist. It was, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. And no wonder they were perplexed, 
stretched after 400 years of spiritual drought, people choking on religious dust, uh, people are now confronted by an even greater spiritual power in the works and words of Jesus. Things that they had only heard about through generations, things that they only read about in scriptures, they were now seeing with their very eyes. And now a spiritual rain was falling on that land of spiritual drought that they could only have dreamed of. It's unfortunate, though, that a great many of the folks in those crowds were only intrigued by Christ's miracles. They, too, were drawn like moths to the flame, and they were interested in it as long as it was interesting. The miracles came, and they were fed, and their needs were met, and they were happy as long as that was the case. But if anything deeper was called for, then they began to reject Jesus. There were some, however who were with Jesus and who were in with Jesus uh, for the long haul. These are people who had basically made Jesus the head of their household, who had become his family, who had put their lives in his hands, the people we know as disciples. And they, while they were full of every human flaw, just like us, they saw more clearly than others who Jesus is. When Jesus is gathered with his disciples, it says he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they give him the same answers that Herod did. You know, some in the crowd say you're Elijah returned. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're one of the prophets arisen again. But then Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? And it is Peter who answers. Poor old Peter. I feel a lot like Peter sometimes. Peter is probably the person I most identify with in the scriptures because he is the one who maybe has a good heart and wants to do the right thing but often blusters into doing the wrong thing and shoots off his mouth and says, you know, trying to be good but says the wrong thing. But the Lord uses him anyway. And so it is Peter who answers here. Peter who is imperfect but who still yet at this moment has spiritual insight greater than anything other than the prophets in hundreds of years at that point. And Peter answers, you are the Messiah of God. Now, of course, Jesus is much more than that. And the disciples will learn that as they go, culminating, of course, in Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and in the day of Pentecost. But at this moment, Peter sees clearly who Jesus is in a way that others do not. Peter sees that he is the Messiah that Israel has been waiting on all this time. Notice that no one else has used that term. No one else has said that they thought Jesus was the Messiah. They thought he was a prophet of some sort, possibly, but they never came to the point of saying Messiah. And notice that it isn't the powerful King Herod who knows the truth. He knows something is afoot out there, but he is perplexed by it. And notice that it isn't the crowds who know the truth. They benefit from Christ's miracles, but... That seems to be all they're concerned with is whatever can be done for them. <coughs> and notice that it isn't the self-righteous Pharisees or the religious scholars or lawyers who seem to know the truth. When they are confronted with Jesus, they hate him. And notice that it's not the Sadducees, the princes of Israel who ran the temple and the priesthood who knew the truth. Once they came to know Jesus, they plotted to kill him. No, it's none of these that you would expect to know the truth and know it. It is instead the simple Galilean fisherman, Peter, often rash and outspoken, but whose heart is open to Christ and to the power of the Spirit. He knows that Jesus is the promised one, not just a promised one, but the promised one, the prophet, priest, and king who the Messiah was to be. How can Peter see what these others cannot. It doesn't appear to be a function of power or powerlessness, of rich or poor, or of being educated or uneducated, because all those streams and extremes exist in all these other people in the crowd, and Pharisees and Sadducees and Herod. You know, Herod was rich and powerful. He didn't know. The people in the crowds were mostly poor and not powerful, but they didn't know. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were highly educated, but they didn't know. And many in the crowd, of course, were utterly uneducated, and they didn't know. 
So it doesn't seem to be a function of any of those things. But Scripture tells us what it is that makes the difference. It is a function, a matter of the Holy Spirit and an open and willing heart. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, we read that no one can say that Jesus is Lord unless it is the Holy Spirit that says it through them. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that is able to unlock and open a heart and that convicts the soul and draws people to Christ so that the promise of salvation can be fulfilled in them. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we hear Christ knocking on our door. And like it says in Revelation, we can open the door and Christ will come in and sup with us and us with him. Without the Holy Spirit in our lives, the Word of God is just simply black letters on a white page that signify nothing. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the spiritual truths that are given in Scripture, that the Lord tells us, will seem to be just empty foolishness, so often like they do to the world around us. Without the Holy Spirit, the heart remains a stone, and the head remains a block of wood when it comes to a revelation of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Like Herod, and like the crowds, people even today may be drawn to the light like moths to the flame because all they've known is the darkness and the light intrigues them. But others, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, may be irritated and angered by the light. But the Holy Spirit will bring that light to hearts that are open to Him, to the truth of God. Herod was in his time perplexed, and a great part of the world will always be largely perplexed by any spiritual truth, though it will be drawn always to spiritual activity, whether that activity be of God or not. We see that going on all around us in the world today. There is a great and abiding thirst and interest in spiritual and supernatural things, but not really much concern whether those things are good or bad. No, Jesus still perplexes and he still yet brings anger and irritation to others. But to those believers who will open their heart to the power of the Holy Spirit, what perplexes the rest of the world becomes the building blocks of our lives and faith. The one who perplexes the world, Jesus Christ, becomes not only our Savior and our God, but also our rock, our peace, and our joy and comfort. Let's always endeavor to open our hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit, to pray that the Spirit will enter into our hearts, knowing that the Spirit will always point to Jesus Christ and honor Him, not some human, and that the Holy Spirit will always operate in the love of God, and the Holy Spirit will not contradict or deny or oppose the Word of God. Within those things, we open our hearts to the Spirit to move and to work on us. So let us pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing not only on our worship services and not only on the reading of Scripture like we do on Sundays, but let's pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing in our lives every day, that we might swim in the Holy Spirit like a fish swims in water and need the Holy Spirit as much as a fish needs water. And never give up praying for others, because nothing is impossible with the Holy Spirit who can move any heart in mind can turn stone hearts into hearts of flesh and who can open minds to the truths of the Lord's word. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. As Peter shows, as my life shows, as your life shows, as the life of any believer shows, nothing is impossible with God. There was a missionary by the name of Robert Moffat who went to Africa in the early 1800s. And for long years, he had no converts whatsoever. <clears throat> People were nice to him, but they just didn't convert. And so his home mission society was getting a little concerned about him, and they sent a note to him asking, is there anything we can do for him, thinking that he might say, bring me home. But he sent word back, <clears throat> send me a communion set. And they were thinking, well, that's crazy. He doesn't even have a single convert. What's he going to need a communion set for? But, you know, being nice, they went ahead and sent him the communion set. And before even it could arrive, there was such a revival that broke out that even one communion set would not do. And 
Robert Moffat is seen maybe as the church father of a great church movement that still continues in Central Africa to this day. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. It didn't have anything to do with Robert Moffat's ability or his ability to speak. It had to do with the Holy Spirit opening people's hearts. And the Holy Spirit will move if we open our hearts like Robert Moffat did to work through him. And that the people surrounding him opened their hearts. And those around him opened their hearts. And the revival spread all across that part of the land. I told you before, and, and it's one of my favorite stories, but it reminded me of it a lot, is that there was a great preacher by the name of Spurgeon, you may have heard of Charles Spurgeon, who had huge crowds that would come and hear him speak. There's still books today printed with his sermons in it, even though he preached in the late 1800s. A very good sermon. Though I'm not sure people would sit today for the length of some of those sermons. They're pretty lengthy. But one time he was, he was known to be very eloquent. But he got up and preached what he thought was probably the worst sermon he'd ever preached. He was really ashamed of it by the time he was done with it. But when the sermon was over, he had the greatest response to it of any sermon he'd ever preached. And he said he realized from that that he had had too much pride. It didn't have to do with him or with his eloquence. It had to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit worked through what he said, but he was eloquent or not. So the power of the Holy Spirit will work through us if we open our lives to Him. Let's open our lives to the Spirit and to His movement. Let us pray. Lord, we thank You for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us to remember and realize that the Holy Spirit is at work. We often think about and talk about God the Father and God the Son. And we give You praise. But we often forget about the Spirit as being God as well. We ask that you would help us to keep the Spirit in our hearts, to sense the moving of the Spirit, and to move in the direction that the Spirit wills and calls. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.